This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. talking about um, nutrition and neurodevelopment in general and then with a focus kind of on folate and B vitamins and their relationship to autism spectrum disorders. And so we know that during pregnancy um, there's a lot of growth and development going on and this growth requires nutrients and especially um, these figures are showing birth weight increases over the course of pregnancy going from eight weeks all the way through the end of pregnancy. And you can see, especially during the second half of pregnancy, there's a large increase in the growth needs and going along with that, the nutrient needs increase. Even in here, even though they don't, there's not a large, um, there's not a marked increase in size of the fetus, there are changes in developmental things going on that still require certain nutrients. Um, but the bulk of nutrients are needed towards the end of pregnancy. And this is what um, nutrition recommendations during pregnancy are based on, typically. Um, but I also want to point out that this smooth curve that happens over pregnancy isn't so smooth. There are these little growth spurts that happen. And so this is showing leg growth velocity and also the fetal weight growth velocity. So there are times during pregnancy where there's little spurts that require extra nutrients. And so it's not a continuous and uniform increase throughout pregnancy. Um, and also, it varies by the nutrient. So the, the mom's body compensates for some of these nutritional needs for growth. And through changes in the nutrient metabolism during pregnancy. And so this includes changes in, changes in the absorption efficiency of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and changes in excretion by the renal system, maternal storage and tissue reserve changes. And these changes are all driven by hormonal changes, fetal demands, and also the maternal nutrient supply. And the mom's behavior also can change to augment the physiologic changes. And so I think any of the women in the audience who have been pregnant can remember some cravings and certain things like that that are driven by, from a physiologic standpoint. So I know that I had sun cravings for raw cabbage and ate a half a head just straight raw, which I had never done otherwise, and um, also things like beef that I don't normally eat a lot of. And these are my body's way of telling me that, oh, I need some iron or I need a different nutrient that's included in those foods. And so those cravings are in response to our needs. Um, but there is a limit to the, the amount of physiologic capacity to adjust the metabolism, and especially if the mom's diet doesn't keep up with those changes. And when that limit is exceeded, the fetal growth and development can be impaired. And these are things we know from um, not only animal studies and um, model systems, but in human studies as well with through certain rare cases where there's a genetic disorder or something that changes the metabolism or um, so it's less efficient and then we can see the outcomes and the children are suffering. Um, so this is what the nutrient, nutrient recommendations during pregnancy are based on. Um, they're geared to help provide guidelines for women so they can meet the needs for most people during pregnancy. And so as you can see, um, these are the dietary recommended intakes for women of childbearing age, and uh, whether they're non-pregnant or pregnant, and the percent increase during pregnancy of the required amounts needed. And so you can see that it varies quite a bit um, depending on the different nutrient. Um, and some of this is due to that, the changes in metabolism. So for instance, calcium, you can see that even though it's very important uh, for building bone and things during pregnancy, the, 
that there's no percent increase recommended during pregnancy if you're already at the recommended intake for women of childbearing age, which is often not the case. But if you are, there's no increase in recommended because the, the body changes its, and makes its absorption and more efficient, so it compensates. Um, and some more recommendations. So these are the more micronutrients, and you can, again, see a range in the differences in the percent increase needed during pregnancy. And again, this is to meet the needs of most people. So certain people who have certain genetic backgrounds might need more than this or less than this. Um, and another point to point out is that this is from more recent um, guidelines that came out in 2008 or that are focused on providing healthy outcomes in the fetus as opposed to just overcoming nutrient deficiencies, which is what past recommendations were based on. And so we, again, I mentioned how we know about some of the importance of nutrition during pregnancy from unfortunate events like genetic disorders or um, other things that happen. Um, can result from things like the Dutch famine. So this was a period during World War II in 1944 and 1945 where there was a natural experiment of severe but brief undernutrition during pregnancy. And so the German created a blockade in Amsterdam from a specific window of time from December of 1944 to April of 1945. And this also occurred during a particularly severe winter and so it was labeled the Dutch hunger winter because some, many, many thousands of people died from starvation, but there were also millions that were affected but survived. Um, and the rations that had, so they blocked incoming food and the rations allowed people were cut in half from a normal 2,000 calorie diet down to less than half of that. And then when they were, um, when the Netherlands were liberated in May of 1945, the food supply immediately increased back up to normal levels. And so we have this very defined window of time where people were exposed to undernutrition. So there were studies that took advantage of this unfortunate event, um, but then they were able to look at women who were pregnant during this time all through pregnancy and to see uh, what specific periods of pregnancy they were exposed to this undernutrition and to look at the effects in the offspring. And so one of the main things I wanted to point out was there's different effects depending on when the mother was exposed to this undernutrition. And you can see that especially during this periconception period or right around the time that um, conception happened is when there were the increased occurrence of neurodevelopmental conditions. So um, conditions that result from brain development, which happens, starts early in pregnancy, and specifically in um, neural tube defects, which is a defect in how the neural tube closes, which is, ha occurs very early in pregnancy. And this is, the neural tube eventually goes on to form the brain and the spinal cord. And also in schizophrenia, which is now known to be a neural developmental disorder. And so the neural developmental consequences tended to occur when the undernutrition occurred really at the very beginning of pregnancy, maybe even before women knew they were pregnant. And then there were other outcomes later in time. Uh, another way that we know that nutrition is important um, for uh, conditions is, especially neural development, um, is that we, we can see that these outcomes are associated with a short pregnancy interval so this means that after a mom has one child, she doesn't wait, like, say, six months before she gets pregnant with another child. And so that would be considered a short interpregnancy interval as opposed to waiting two years between pregnancies. Um, and so the, one of the reasons we, um, this short interpregnancy interval seems to be important is because the mom, it, her body doesn't have time to replete herself after um, towards the end of the pregnancy where her stores tend to get depleted because of the increased demands for growth. And this is especially associated with conditions that um, would be have their susceptible period near conception and that, that happens to go along with the finding of neural tube defects and schizophrenia also which were affected in the 
um, by under undernutrition in the Dutch hunger winter that also were affected by these short interpregnancy intervals. So uh, some things, the, the evidence is kind of coming together to show that nutrition during very, very early pregnancy seems to be important for at least these two neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, another finding that we see with both neural tube effects and schizophrenia is that there are seasonal effects such that if uh, moms become pregnant and are con conceived during the very early um, spring months, there is increased risk for their child to later develop neural tube defects or schizophrenia. And again, there are different theories on why these seasonal effects occur, but one of the theories is that this is because nutrition during the winter months is low because there aren't fruits and vegetables and things available because of the winters. And this is um, a consistent finding over both hemispheres and various parts countries around the world. And so one of the things we started wondering is, um, because autism is a neural developmental disorder, we wondered if maybe nutrition was playing a role in autism. And so I thought I'd start by talking about what autism is. And as I mentioned, it's a neural developmental disorder. It means there's um, aberrations in how the brain develops. And we know this from imaging studies and post-mortem brain studies that show differences between typically developing people and people with autism. And it's characterized by behavioral outcomes like impairments in social reciprocity, language and communication deficits, and the presence of repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. And these usually um, present themselves by the age of 36 months. As I mentioned, there's a neurobiologic basis and the prevalence in the United States has been increasing, and it's now at one in every 88 children, and estimated by the CDC, and it's more common in males than females with a four to five to one ratio. Um, so it's affecting one in every 54 males. And one thing that we have known kind of early on is that it's a highly heritable condition, meaning it runs in families so that if you have a child with autism already, you're more likely to have another child with autism. Or if you have autism in the family, the child is at greater risk. Um, so we know that genes are, probably have some involvement in the etiology of autism. And early studies showed that from twins, identical twins, um, showed that the, there were evidence for high heritability with 90, 40 to 90% of um, twins that are identical for their genotype to be also identical in having or not having autism. Um, and then there was lower concordance rate for, um, for diazygotic twins. So these are twins that do not share the same genes. And so, that told us that there is some sort of genetic component that is contributing to autism. Um, but now we all know, because of the large um, interest in finding the genes responsible for autism, we know that it's not a simple one gene kind of hit, where most people agree at this point that there's a heterogeneous etiology involved in autism. And it probably involves multiple genes and lots of different chromosome regions. And gene and by gene interactions. So the combination of gene environment interactions are also likely. And so it, in other words, it's very complicated. Um, but we still believe there's a genetic component, but it probably takes multiple things going on to produce the various different types of autism spectrum disorders. And the very most recent study, and the largest to date, um, has sh suggested that in the shared in utero environment tends to be very important, perhaps even more important than the genetic factors um, in autism risk, which changed some thinking. So what else causes autism? So this is not you know, an ex uh, a list of everything that's been studied, but some of the more recent findings and things that are kind of becoming more established. Um, so as I mentioned, um, well, I did. So there was a, a finding for birth order effects, so that um, 
either the first or last child have different risks of autism. And this typically suggests that there's some environmental role um, or in, in utero effects that happen. And this is pre found in both multiplex families, so ones having more than one child with autism, and in simplex families where only one child is affected. Advancing parental age of both the mother and the father have been associated with increased risk for autism. And while age itself is probably not um, the cause, it gives us clues into things that change as we age um, that might be responsible. And one of those things is our genetics, and um, it's possible that that might be partly explaining some of that. But there might be other issues. Um, for instance, nutrient absorption goes down as we age, or things like that that could be going on. Also, obstetric and perinatal factors have been associated with autism, although it's kind of the question of a chicken and egg in this case, because even though they're associated, if we think that the important period might come before that, or they could just be along the causal pathway, um, so that if the child has some sort of development goes awry during pregnancy, um, these could just be exhibiting themselves as complications during pregnancy or delivery that um, then later on present themselves as autism and they could not necessarily be causing autism. Prenatal infections have been shown, especially rubella, to cause autism and to increase risk by a huge factor, um, but it's not very common anymore because most people are vaccinated for rubella. Medications have also been shown to greatly increase the risk for autism certain ones uh, that are no longer used during pregnancy, like thalidomide, um, but also valproate and SSRIs, that serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So there's very, so I'll talk a little bit more about some of those findings, but for the timing, but it is show, there are environmental things that we're finding during pregnancy can impact risk for autism. Um, also, pesticides have been pretty, in more than one study have been shown to increase risk for autism. And uh, in particular, they're showing studies where really concentric rings around um, where there's been pesticide exposure and the risk for autism kind of goes down as you get further away. So it's pretty good evidence showing that pesticides of certain types of pesticides, um, exposure during pregnancy could be increasing risk for autism. Closely spaced pregnancies, as I mentioned, for other conditions has also been linked to autism, and I'll show you the data from this finding. And then maternal metabolic conditions, as was me mentioned in the keynote, um, has recently been associated with autism spectrum disorders. So that would be obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure in the mother during pregnancy. And maternal fever during pregnancy has been asso associated with autism risk. And the month of conception, as mentioned again for the other conditions, has also been linked to autism, or been seen to vary over autism risk. Um, so here's the study by Usaini Zerbo, um, done in 2011, showing the seasonality effects in autism. And there have actually there have been many studies looking at this, and they're not entirely consistent, but this is the largest study to date. And you can see that it doesn't vary. A, this is the incidence of autism um, per 10,000 conceptions. So, um, and so the higher it is, the higher the autism occurrence. Um, and you can see that, and then the, on the bottom is the months of conception. And you can see that conceptions, especially in March, um, have the highest associated incidence of autism um, associated with them. And so, and it goes down, especially in the summer months. Um, and this could be interpreted different ways, so it may not be the month of conception that's important. This could be saying that really, it's having a second trimester starting in May or June is the um, time that's associated with increased risk for autism. And so I, without knowing when the developmental window of autism is, it's hard to interpret these kinds of seasonal things. But we can say that because it changes over time, that perhaps things in our environment that change over time are having an influence on the risk or the development of autism. And so what 
I have here is a chart kind of putting together the findings in autism so far that have looked at the question of timing. And especially these post-mortem autopsy studies and um, imaging studies also show that it looks like there's abnormalities in neuronal migration and maturation, and these are things that tend to occur before the 16th fetal week. And so that narrows it down a little bit, so we do see some changes that we can identify a period that's possibly going awry for autism. Um, and then again, going back to those studies of the environmental factors that could be playing a role in autism, um, some of these have looked at timing, and some are as vague as just saying during pregnancy. Um, but, you know, and that was a very early finding, but others now have looked, um, especially like the thalidomide studies, you can get pretty good data on when exactly they were exposed and look at that in relation to whether the child developed autism or not. And they, they tend to cluster around day 20 to 24, so in the third week or so of after conception. So very early, it looks like, in those studies. Um, uh, and it seems like even with the later findings, it's kind of coming to a consensus on the early part of pregnancy seems to be very important for autism risk, at least with environmental factors. Um, and so again, some of these studies with the pesticides have showed that it's around neural tube closure, same with the um, medication studies, and so there, we think there might be something in common with this timing with some of the other neurodevelopmental disorders. And so one of the other questions that comes up is because I had shown you that chart that showed how the nutrition demands tend to increase over pregnancy and they're greatest towards the end of pregnancy. Why is the beginning of pregnancy having these uh, nutrition during the very early pregnancy having an effect on some of these neurodevelopmental outcomes? And so the next question is, well, what nutrient is important during this period? And there aren't really that many that are really key at this very, very early part of pregnancy, but one that's now pretty well known to be established to be important um, during the very early period right around conception is folic acid and folate. So folic acid is a synthetic form of folate which occurs naturally in things like green leafy vegetables and citrus fruits. Um, and we know that near conception, the amount of folic acid that a mother takes can determine whether or influence her risk for having a child with neural tube defects. Um, and it can, if she takes a supplement, it can decrease her risk for having a child with a neural tube defect by 50 to 70 percent. So that's a pretty big decrease in risk associated with something pretty simple like taking a folic acid supplement. And this was shown in randomized clinical trials after observational studies had shown that mothers of, who had these children with neural tube defects tended to be low in folate, and, um, but then in randomized clinical trials where they gave some women supplements in folic acid specifically or versus multivitamins versus nothing at all, um, the women who had a folic acid supplement had much lower risk for having a child with neural tube defects. And so that was kind of the impotent, or, well, and it was also known that um, especially if moms had, uh, or the child, had a genetic change that led to less efficient folate metabolism. And there's a specific gene called methylene tetrahydrate folate reductase that's important for folate metabolism. And if the moms or the children had this, a variant in this gene that led to less efficient folate metabolism, the folate supplementation was even more beneficial to, for those families. So questions? Um, and so, so the guidelines came out that mothers should take a folate, folic acid supplement before and during very early pregnancy, but because over 50% of pregnancies are unplanned and taking a prenatal vitamin or some folic acid supplement before pregnancy or during the very first weeks of pregnancy requires planning a pregnancy, um, we are missing a lot of those women. Um, and so that's when the United States began mandatory fortification of cereal grains with folic acid. It started in 1998. It was mandatory for um, all grain manufacturers to fortify their grains with folic acid. And since this uh, fortification, 
there's been a decrease in the um, prevalence of neural tube defects in the United States shown. And, but we, they still recommend that women take folic acid supplements on top of that before and during very early pregnancy because the amount in fortified foods isn't really enough. That's kind of to get enough to prevent neural tube defects, but some argue it's not enough for everybody, especially the ones with the certain genetic changes that might make them need more. Um, so it's kind of a grand experiment that the United States is doing. And now other countries have followed, many other countries, and have seen similar decreases in the prevalence of neural tube defects in places like Canada and Europe. Um, but the mechanisms behind this protective effect and decreased risk associated with folic acid supplementation, even though we've known about it you know, since the early 90s, it's still unknown. And one of the mechanisms that we suspect or suspect, um, well, I should also mention there are other, not only folate is important, but other B-complex vitamins that are somewhat related to the function or overlap in function with folate have also been shown to reduce the risk for neural tube defects. These include vitamin B12 and choline or betaine. Um, and all of these vitamins are needed for one carbon metabolism and epigenetic methylation reactions. So I'll explain what those are and um, their, how their role fits in. And that's one of the mechanisms people think might be behind the reduction in risk associated with folic acid supplementation. So epigenetics is literally is translated to mean over and above genetics. And what it means is it's what, it's what makes our DNA not our destiny. So basically, it's heritable changes in gene expression caused by mechanisms other than changes in the underlying DNA sequence. So in other words, it's functionally relevant modifications to the genome that do not involve a change in the nucleotide sequence. So in other words, you have the, what's written but it changes how it's read. So DNA was, it would be what's written, and then how it's read and interpreted is, is how, what epigenetics does. Um, so and this has, it's becoming, a, it's a growing area of interest. Um, it gets a lot of press because it's, it's kind of exciting to see, because for a while people thought, oh, you're born with these genes, you're stuck with them, there's nothing you can do. I think it's exciting because it's saying, hey, there's, the, because they can be these other issues that, or things that go on on top of the genes that you're given, um, there might be a way to modify risk that goes along with the genes that you might have gotten. Um, so there are many different layers of epigenetic codes. So in other words, there are different mechanisms that are all lumped into epigenetics that change how DNA is read and used. Um, <laughs> and translated, so another definition. So that these changes are inherited, you get them from pregnancy or from your parents, um, but they also can be reversed but from environmental exposures. And these modifications do not necessarily change, the, they don't change the sequence of your DNA, but they change how the, the DNA and genes are expressed, which can lead to other changes that we'll talk a little bit more about. And so one of the first layers of these epigenetic codes, and the one I'm most interested in, is DNA methylation. And what it is is this addition of a little methyl group, which is a carbon um, atom with three hydrogens around it. And it, it's attached to, so this would be our DNA, and it's attached to the C letters in our DNA, a uh, cytosine. And this little mark can influence how that, the gene that's in this DNA sequence is read. And it usually inhibits expression of that gene. And then the next layer is histone modifications that can occur. So histones are these proteins here that are how our DNA are organized and wrapped around. And also, these configurations influence how our genes are expressed or not. Um, and so there are different types of modifications. There, again, could be methylation of this 
the histone tails or also acetylation and phosphorylation. So different ways of changing the t histone tails that change the configuration and also change how genes are expressed. And there are many more um, having going kind of up the scale of how the chromatins are structured and arranged within chromosomes and um, also regulatory RNAs like microRNAs. All these other things also change expression of genes. So there are a lot of things going on on, on top of our genetic code that influence how our genes are expressed and basically how we function and develop. Um, and so I mentioned that it can change gene expression, it usually inhibits it. It, but, and I also mentioned it can be influenced by the environment. So things like diet or stress and other environmental factors have been shown in animal studies and now human studies to influence our DNA methylation. And so they also have shown that you know identical twins at birth have very similar epigenetic marks and DNA methylation at birth, but as they age, their epigenetic codes change quite a bit. And by the end of life, they are pretty different. Um, so we know that what we are exposed to over our lifetime changes these marks on our genome. Um, and then also to maintain normal DNA methylation patterns, dietary methyl groups are needed. So there have been studies showing that diets in low and folate and other methyl donors, um, the people tend to have hypomethylation or low levels of methylation on their DNA. Um, and so this is kind of complicated, but it's just kind of showing how the folate cycle, which would be here, connects to methylation of DNA and RNA and histones and neurotransmitters and lots of other things um, all through this homocysteine to methionine pathway that's involves lots of these different nutrients that I've kind of mentioned, like choline and betaine and B12 and folate and folic acid. Um, so we know kind of the biochemistry behind these interactions. And so we understand that um, all these things could be imp important for gene expression down the line. And gene expression can be very important for child neural development. And going to um, specifically during pregnancy, the levels of the mother's dietary methyl donors, like folate, um, can influence the offspring's DNA methylation. So this has been shown in animal studies where they modify the mother's diet during specific periods, especially during early pregnancy again. Um, and, and I'll explain why in a minute why that's an important period. But they can show that if, if they just lower the level of the methyl donors in her diet, just for a brief period in early pregnancy and then put it back up, the offspring can have very different DNA methylation at certain sites. Um, this is also shown in human studies and going back to the Dutch hunger winner, they looked at some of the kids of the mothers who had undernutrition again during early pregnancy and found that those kids had lower methylation levels in general and aberrant DNA methylation, meaning that in some, not only do globally levels decrease, but when some, some sites decrease in methylation, other sites will get hypermethylated and get more methylated. Um, and so it's just, it just leads to all kinds of different genetic expression changes. Um, and so going on to the gene expression changes, those have been also shown in both of those animal and human studies as well, showing that at specific sites, the methylation that um, influence or the maternal diet can influence how genes are expressed, whether they're turned on or turned off. Also, so in, in these animal studies, they've also shown that the changes in, from the maternal diet that lead to DNA methylation and gene expression changes also can lead to different health outcomes in the offspring. And so this has been shown in the agouti mouse, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with these mice. They're famous in the epigenetic world. Um, and there's a wonderful little PBS special on epigenetics, and it explains these in more detail. But I'll just kind of start, summarize it by saying, these are genetically identical mice, and they have the same mom. But in one pregnancy, she was supplemented, oh, so I should mention, so this yellow agouti mouse is 
has a genetic defect that makes it obese and it has lots of other health issues associated with it like diabetes and um, other issues. Um, so it's a known mo mouse model. And then when the mother who's, who is this type of mouse has a high load of methyls donors in her diet, so they add lots of folate and other things um, in her diet during early pregnancy, this is what comes out. <laughs> so instead of getting another generation of these large, obese, yellow-coated mice, that defective gene is turned off, and they get a normal, sleek, um, thinner, more active, typical brown mouse. And so this is the normal phenotype, but with the abnormal genotype that's been rescued by a high methyl load in the mom's diet. And so, again, if you watch this um, special, it explained it in more detail, but um, this is one of the early studies showing, hey, we can modify how our genes um, are functioning by changing the mom's diet during pregnancy. And, so, and, and it can have long-term consequences. And so then I wanted to also mention, uh, I had mentioned that changing the mom's diet in early pregnancy was especially important. And so one of the things you might ask is, why is that period so important? And the reason, and the, another reason I'm interested in DNA methylation in particular is that during fertilization, or right after fertilization, DNA methylation, the whole epigenome um, is wiped out. And, it, and it, then it's slowly reestablished. And this all happens very early. So this is fertilization here. And the blue line is showing the paternal um, epigenetic effects. And the red is showing the maternal epigenetic effect or factors or marks. And you can see that there, and this is the total level of DNA methylation over here. And so the whole, it's completely wiped out, both paternal and maternal, all before the blastocyst is formed. So very early, I guess I don't have the actual um, weeks in there, but this is all you know, very early before mom knows she's pregnant, basically. And then it's reestablished also very early. And so this is why this might be a critical period for epigenet from an epigenetic point of view right around conception because these new patterns of DNA methylation are being established and they need these methyl donors in order to have adequate amounts of methyl donors to um, establish that pattern. I'm gonna move on to data from our studies, um, basically looking at all of these effects in uh, children with autism and to see whether these could be playing important roles in autism. And so I'm gonna start with findings that have been mentioned from the large charge case control study. It's the Childhood Autism Risk from Genetics and Environment. And this study is led by Dr. Overhertz Pachoda. And there are basically three diagnostic groups. And there are children with autism or developmental delay diagnosed in the California Department of Developmental Services um, and enrolled into our study. And then also general population controls are frequency matched to the projected distributions of cases on the basis of age, gender, and geography. Um, are, these are all pulled from the California birth files. And all children are brought into the Mind Institute here in Sacramento, and they're clinically confirmed to have diagnoses of autism or autism spectrum disorder, developmental delay, and typical development. And so you can see from this, this is California, and just to point out, in general, the charge participants are from Northern California, and this is because they are brought into the mind and they have to come in for that confirmation of diagnosis. So most of them are within driving distance to the mind. And in this study, we ask about number of environmental exposures and their health histories and you know all kinds of questions and then we collect a ton of samples basically everything they'll give us um, but one of the questions that was collected is asking about prenatal vitamin and other supplements that they might have taken and 
on that list are prenatal vitamins and multivitamins, folic acid specific vitamins, and a lot of other vitamins. And also um, cereals, breakfast cereals that tend to be fortified with all of many of these vitamins, and other supplements that might contain these kinds of vitamins like um, breakfast shakes and protein bars and things like that. And then for all the questions or responses where they say, yes, I took one of those things, um, we ask about during index period, which for us is the three months before pregnancy, throughout pregnancy, and then during breastfeeding. And so we ask which months in particular during that period that they might have taken these vitamins, and then we ask how many pills or servings per day that they had, and what the frequency and dose per day was. And also the name of the vitamin or cereal. So this, we actually ask it differently now, but this is the old questionnaire, which is what our data is from. Um, and then we, we looked at whether, um, just a, something quick um, is prenatal vitamin use that we looked at. And the reason we chose prenatal vitamins is because prenatal vitamins contain about twice as much folic acid as a multivitamin would. And again, it's recommended for during pregnancy. So we compared um, during each month the intake of prenatal vitamins for case moms versus controls. And so you can see that the mothers of children with autism here in blue were significantly less likely to take a prenatal vitamin, especially during the three months before pregnancy and the very first month of pregnancy, compared to mothers of typically developing children in green. And so during that period, um, taking a prenatal vitamin was associated with a highly reduced risk of developing autism in the child with an odds ratio of 0.6, so nearly half. Um, then we went on to look at whether, and that was, I should mention, that was adjusted for maternal education and the child's year of birth, and we looked at lots of other factors that might have influenced, um, like whether she was planning the pregnancy and, and um, other things. Then we also looked at, because I knew how important certain genetic factors were to folate metabolism, um, and we suspected that, well, we. I should also mention that we did not find a similar association with multivitamin use. But in our study, very few women took multivitamins. We had very low numbers in both groups of women who took multivitamins um, before and during pregnancy. And so um, one of the big differences between multivitamins and prenatal vitamins is iron and folate. And because iron's usually needed more towards the end of pregnancy, and we were seeing an effect in the beginning of pregnancy or before, folic acid seemed to make sense to look at. And so we looked at genes within the folate pathway. So these are the same pathways I put up earlier, but with more details, which you probably aren't interested in. But I just wanted to point out that, because um, we looked at these genes within these pathways, so all the genes are in the little square boxes, and you can kind of see where they fit in the folate pathway or the um, homocysteine methionine pathway that connects it to the methylation pathway. And we only looked at one gene really in the methylation pathway, which was this COMPT um, gene. And so in orange are all the genes that we genotyped for both the moms, fathers, and children in this study. And what we found was that all of these um, genes highlighted in green boxes um, were cases where if the mom had the gene variants in these genes and she did not take a prenatal vitamin during that specific window three months before in the very first month of pregnancy, that the child was much high, had much higher risk for developing autism. And, I'm, and in certain cases, I'll show you the numbers in a minute, but it was much higher. Um, and then in the, we also saw in that one gene that's involved in methylation, again, if the child had a gene variant leading to a less efficient enzyme, we saw, and the mom did not take a prenatal vitamin during pregnancy, then the child was at much greater risk for developing autism. And so here are the numbers that go along with that. Um, so I just want to highlight, so you're probably not used to looking at it this way. So here are the maternal genes um, that we studied, and then the genotype and um, the second one listed is usually the 
less efficient gene or the minor allele that less, fewer people have. And this is prenatal vitamin intake during that pre near, near conception and whether they took it, yes or no. And so you can see that by itself, not taking a prenatal vitamin was associated with a little bit of risk in people who were uh, wild type, but I don't have the um, p-values or confidence intervals up here, but that was not significant. But if, and then the genotype itself was also not associated with increased risk in those who did take a prenatal vitamin. But if they did not take a prenatal vitamin and they had that variant, then they were, the child was at almost four and a half times the risk for developing autism. And so that's how to read this. And then here's what you would expect if we added the risk from both exposures alone. And here's what you would get if you multiplied the risk from the both exposures alone. And those are just two different ways of looking at interaction effects. And you can see that in all cases, the combined effect was more than what you would expect from adding the individual effects up. So to summarize, if the mom had variants that were associated with inefficient one carbon metabolism, and she did not take a prenatal vitamin, the child was at greater risk of developing autism than if either one alone. And then uh, similarly with the child, the one uh, methylate, methylation related gene, um, we saw that if the child had that gene variant, they were at increased risk anyway just from the gene, the, having that genotype. But if the mom did not take a prenatal vitamin, that risk rose um, several times above what you would expect from the combined um, effects. So there seemed to be something. This is also showing us that environment combined with the genetic susceptibility um, could put the child at much greater risk for autism. And so. This um, came out last year, and it, it received a lot of press in various places and was recognized in a couple different places as a paper of the year. And the reason for this is because this is, even though we had long suspected there probably are gene environment interactions going on in the etiology of autism, this is one of the first studies to actually show one of these environment gene interactions. Um, and I think there'll be, there are, seven, since there have been a couple more studies showing similar effects with different exposures and genes. We went on to, because again, we suspected folic acid was important, we went on to quantify the amount of folic acid from all those sources. So previously I was just showing you prenatal vitamin or not um, during time, different timing. But we also looked at the total amount of synthetic, fortified, supplemental um, folic acid that the mom was consuming during, again, the same months, three months before pregnancy and all the way throughout. And I, the typically developed, the mothers of typically developing children here in blue, you can see were, had higher intakes of total folic acid on average um, for the whole period of pregnancy compared to the mothers of children with autism spectrum disorders. And here we also have um, the develop, mothers of developmental delay on here which you can see had lower intake before pregnancy and then had higher intake than typically um, developed families throughout the rest of pregnancy. Um, but primarily the difference between the mothers of children with autism and typically developing children was during the very first month of pregnancy. And so we narrowed the window a little bit further and showed that that was the, the month that seemed to be most important. But you can see that it is also different beforehand. And then after pregnancy starts, really all the groups are not too different. Um, so during that very first month of pregnancy, you can see that as the mother's reported folic acid intake went up, the risk for autism spectrum disorders in the child went down. And it was most significant for the highest level. And so I will also mention that we looked at you know, very high levels and to see if there was increased risk, um, but there wasn't for, at least for autism. Doesn't mean there weren't for other outcomes. And so the, there was a trend that was significant. Um, and then we also adjusted for all the levels of the other nutrients that tend to also be in all these same sources. So um, fortified cereals don't only have folic acid, they tend to have iron and um, B12 and lots of other vitamins in them. So when we uh, we summed up the levels of all those things in the same sources and adjusted for that. And you can see that there's still that general trend and it moved it actually into the um, more significant direction. 
The next thing we did for this study was to stratify by the um, MTH, MTHFR genotype of both the mother and the child. And so kind of like we expected, we found that, so here's with all genotypes combined, we saw, a, so this is looking at um, if they had, were meeting the recommendation for pregnancy of folic acid, which is 600 micrograms or not. Um, so if they had 600 micrograms or more of folic acid during that first month of pregnancy, it was associated with a reduced risk for the child to develop autism with about an odds ratio, again, around 0.6. Um, and that's looking at all people combined, regardless of genotype. And then when we broke it down by the maternal genotype, so this, we, this is the wild type genotype where they um, metabolize folate efficiently and less efficiently in this genotype. Um, what we found was in the ones with the wild type efficient genotype, folic acid above 600 micrograms did not seem to reduce risk for autism at all. Um, but if the mom had at least one variant allele, then folic acid helped reduce the risk for autism by quite a bit, less, by less than half. Same thing with the child genotype. So if the child was wild type and m metabolized folate efficiently, efficiently, folic acid was not associated with reduced risk for autism. But if the child did have a variant genotype, um, then they, their reduced was nearly half. And when we combine both mother and child, so here our numbers get a little bit small and the confidence intervals get wider, but again, if both mom and child were wild type and did not have that variant, Folic acid was not helpful, but if either the mom or the child had at least one variant allele, then folic acid reduced risk for autism by less than half. And when you know both of them had that variant gene type, it was associated with even greater reduced risk. Um, so just to summarize these findings, um, we saw decreased risk for autism associated with maternal periconceptional prenatal vitamin and folic acid intake, especially in individuals with inefficient one carbon metabolism. Um, the effect size, the timing, and the effect modification by the MTHFR gene are similar to what we have seen for neural tube defects. Um, and also, folic acid supplementation during early pregnancy has also been shown to be associated with fewer behavioral problems at 18 months and these are in cohort studies where um, the information they've collected is probably more accurate because they're not depending on mom's memory. Um, it's also been associated with lower risk for severe language delay at three years, improved verbal and verbal executive function, attention, and social competence at four years, and reduced hyperactivity and fewer peer problems at eight years old. So we're not alone in this. this um, folic acid has been shown to reduce other behavioral and potentially neurodevelopmental um, outcomes in children. Um, but again, these, even though they're cohort studies and this information is collected prospectively before these um, outcomes are known, the moms who take folic acid might just be different than the ones that don't in ways that we don't adjust for, because we do adjust for things like maternal education and other um, behaviors that we know of, but there could be things that we don't adjust for. And so the only way to get around that is to do a clinical trial and see um, if there are those uh, associations hold. Um, so I mentioned kind of some of the next steps. So one of the issues I, I mentioned with the study we did so far was that we relied on maternal recall of her intake of these things during pregnancy several years back. And so one way we're kind of getting around this is now we've been funded to look at the folate in the child's newborn blood spot um, punch that we can get um, so that we can kind of go back in time and see what the child's folate levels were before their diagnosis. Um, and, and at the same time, we're also going to look at the child's DNA methylation in that very early few, first few days after birth and then look at the associations with autism. Um, and then also we have this prospective study um, called Markers of Autism Risk in Babies Learning Early Signs, MARBLES for short, um, also led by Dr. Overhertz-Pachoto. And 
This is a study of mothers who have a child with autism and are planning pregnancy or are pregnant already with another child. And we have a little over 200 right now, but we're going to get, by the end of the next five years, hopefully 450 mom-child pairs. And, and we are with these moms as soon as we enroll them, which is hopefully anywhere from before pregnancy where most people enter around the second trimester. But we collect information and samples all the way through pregnancy, and then we bring the child in um, at regular intervals once they're born and get a final diagnosis of autism or typical development. And other, we also look at other outcomes um, like language delay and those types of things. Um, at 36 months. So it's, we're waiting right now. We have uh, folate, B12, B6, and choline measured in all of these moms. And we are basically just waiting for the children to age in order to get a definitive diagnosis. We have about 70 that have reached the age of three years. Um, we, we were hoping we could use their diagnosis at 24 months, at two years, to do some earlier preliminary studies, but we're finding that that diagnosis doesn't always hold as much as we'd hoped, so we're waiting now until they're three years old. Um, but we also plan to get um, DNA methylation on these moms and children as, as well to kind of see if we can see signatures of um, epigenetic signatures that might be associated with later development of autism in the mom or child. Um, and I should also mention, you know, I had kind of focused on folate, but the choline has been really important in many animal studies has shown really important um, role for brain development. And it, especially if they don't, animals don't get enough choline, the parts of the brain that are affected tend to be ones affected in autism. And so that's one that we're really interested in. And it kind of plays into that same pathway. Um, and B12 is also, if, Usually vegetarian moms are low in B12, and they've shown that um, B12 can be, ha if the mom's really low, the child can have neurodevelopmental outcomes that are similar. So we're interested in not only folate, but in many other nutrients as well. Um, so I had mentioned kind of the other future directions looking at, so the environmental exposures in general, um, I guess toxicants came up, and that would be this pathway here um, that, again, pulls away from the methylation cycle. And also things like inflammation pull away from that cycle. And so we're going to kind of look at interactions between these other pathways and exposures um, to see if maybe there are, there are other ways we can kind of target certain individuals that would be a high risk for overcome those risks by adding things like folate. So and I want to acknowledge, um, obviously, Irva hertz Pachota, who led both of the studies from the, the data I'm working with, and Janine LaSalle, who's an epigenetics expert and helping with the DNA methylation measures, um, and a whole team of other people involved in genotyping and nutrient measures, and our funders. And then the, a big thank you to the Charge and Marbles participants, of course, who, without this Without their contribution, this work can be done, and also the staff. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.